tout le monde. Euh, merci à vous tous de se joindre à nous pour cette euh, petite conférence qu'on faisait cet après-midi euh, sur euh, ouais, conférence underground sur le réseau euh, industriel. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, j'ai l'honneur d'être accompagné par euh, Dominique, si tu veux te présenter. <rire> S'il euh, te plaît. <rire> euh, donc, moi, c'est Dominique Rosier. Je suis le représentant euh, chez Fortinet pour les technologies opérationnelles qui couvrent de la capitale nationale Ottawa jusqu'à l'Atlantique. Euh, mon rôle est d'aider euh, nos partenaires, nos vendeurs en apportant des connaissances euh, côté euh, technologie opérationnelle et industrielle. Moi, je viens d'un background des, tech, des TI originalement. Ensuite, j'ai travaillé en industrie pendant plusieurs années sur les planchers d'usine. Donc, euh, je connais le milieu, j'ai été dans cet euh, environnement. Et mon rôle est à ce moment-là d'aider à faire le pont entre les TI et les TO euh, au niveau de la cybersécurité. OK. Et euh, on a aussi avec nous Eric. si tu veux faire un petit, une petite présentation sur toi-même. Bonjour à tous, mon nom c'est Eric Garceau, je suis le directeur de compte chez Delinea, un fournisseur de solutions pour les gest la gestion des accès privilégiés. Euh, je couvre le domaine des de, organisations de grandes entreprises pour toute l'Est du Canada, donc les Maritimes et le Québec. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour, Rick. And Mark, yeah. your turn. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Mark Rowland. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Data Sentinel. I've been in this industry now for somewhat over 20 years, uh, and in particular focused in areas of data management, data governance, data privacy. I'm looking forward to the, the session today, so thank you. Mm, thank you, Mark. Uh, and, uh, well, I'm presenting myself. I'm Roger Wallet, Director of the Security Practice at Navi Pro. I've been with Navi Pro for close to uh, 20 years. And prior to that, I've been in the industry for Uh, millionaires and millionaires and <laughs> it's, it's been a long long time i've done integration configuration uh, deployment just about everything but mainframe uh so i'm very happy to be with you guys today and uh, we'll have a fun session so uh let's look at this uh, presentation and the idea of this presentation today uh so the um what we've done and actually i've used the help of a uh, an AI friend of mine uh, to create a new business. <laughs> so the idea today is have a, a, a business case, multiple business case, use case for a new business, but well, not a new business. The business is Asie Tech. So uh, let's see, can we, oops, sorry. Uh, Asie Tech uh, was created in 1985. That's my friend that said that. And uh, Asiatech is a manufacturing, a steel manufacturing company. Uh, they build components for cars. Uh, that's, uh, this is our friends, sorry. So uh, they build steel parts for cars, for uh, aeronautic uh, system, and other different type of businesses. <clears throat> uh, but they want to be more, uh, uh, sorry, I switched to English uh, without saying nothing here, but uh, yeah, we're going in English this afternoon, uh, but not all session, but for this panel. Uh, so they want to implement 4.0 to be able to manage their cost, optimize, and they want to grow their businesses. So uh, this has multiple impact and the CEO, Mr. Labouteille Dassi, <laughs> yeah, I, My friend at AI is weird. <laughs> so the CEO has really some good question regarding uh, cyber insurance. What's the impact going 4.0 on this side and what he should be looking for? So we'll have uh, ConnectWise talking about uh, cyber insurance, how to cover this thing. Uh, he also uh, talked, he gave the mandate to HR for the uh, Build 25, Quebec Build 25 implementation and the future Canadian uh, C27. And uh, Acera, uh, no, sorry, Cornelia Humanius, uh, who's the uh, HR uh, uh, manager, uh, is we're helping her implement this thing, but you just find out by the IT groups that, uh, well, they have no way of knowing where the data, the data is and what data they have. So uh, this is a sort of an issue. And uh, then uh, the uh, the CTO, Mr. Acera Technocumulus, 
oh, AI. <laughs> uh, he, he's looking into uh, moving some workload to uh, the cloud. And also with the adoption of 4.0, industry 3.0, he's thinking maybe some service, SaaS services can be implemented into this. So we're wondering what will be the impact for them by doing this. And like many other businesses, uh, they are very short staff. They're running 10 on staff <clears throat> for the IT for the support. And they're using a lot of consultants. Consultants are accessing remotely, coming in-house to on-premise to work. And uh, it's hard to manage their access, what they're doing. So we'll try to figure out what we can do with this. And uh, on the same for different reasons, but same cause, same, same result is in the operation manager on the on, on the, the plant, Scadius Profibus, who is the operation manager, uh, is uh, using also the Evening Assets to remote consultant, but it's mostly for the uh, the uh, the uh, manufacturer, the machine, the machinery manufacturers. So they're doing the maintenance, they're connecting to the machine. So that's pretty standard for any businesses that are manufacturing side. And lastly, when you think about the fact that they're going industry 4.0, uh, their production, everything they'll be doing is going to rely more and more on IT. IT needs to be running. So how do you monitor this thing? How do you support it? So question is, okay, how do I handle this? Do I create my own SOC, my own NOC internally to be able to support this? What's the cost of doing that? So this will be covered uh, in session this afternoon with, uh, with uh, articles. So, gentlemen, first, what I want to do with you guys, I'm not changing pages. First, can you change? Page? Thank you. <laughs> um, the, uh, let's do some history uh, where the uh, manufacturing, the, the, the uh, industrialization started. So it started in 1780, apparently. I wasn't there. Uh, but that was in the, the industry 1.0 where we're talking about uh, steam uh, operated machines, so like the trains. So this is pretty much where it started. Uh, hundred years later, about industry 2.0 started, where we're starting to have assembly <clears throat> line with some electrification. 1970, now we're going with automation and we're uh, talking about electronics and IT. IT in 1970. Uh -huh. My cell was probably a, a whole office, but that was the start of it. And when you think about today, you've got machinery that's running for 30 years in, in shops. It's, it's, it's after, starting there that we're starting to see machinery with IT. Okay, not 1970s, but later on. Yeah. And then we got 3.5 industry. 3.5 came in uh, in 1980s, where because of communication was here between across the world, we're starting to move workloads, not in the cloud, but in different countries. So reducing costs for some uh, of the those countries. And 4.0 came in for a couple of years ago. 4.0 came in to, to, it was to optimize. It's the introduction of merging the ITs and the OTs to, the OT together. Well, they, they say convergence, but I often hear also data sharing. So we're sharing data between environments to, be, to optimize those process. And more recently, we got the 5.0 that came in, where it's a it's the integration of the human factor in the industry, but the also the social role of the businesses within the society in in the, in the environment and preserving the environment. So that's the 5.0. But if we're coming back to the 4.0, <clears throat> and I wrote eliminate paper when I started, and it's like you know way, way far behind. You said millions of years. Yeah, millions of years. <laughs> I, I started, before I was in IT, I was a, a, a drawing, I was a conceptor, a conceptor, this industrial, so drawing industrial design. Mm -hmm. So I did some, used to work on machineries, you know, and to program those machine, you were had your punch card. You created punch card and you brought it to your machine and tuck that in the connected in the slot there. And there you go. And this is my program. So uh, industry 4.0 was 
try not to do that anymore. <laughs> so uh, remove that. So it's the actual principle of Industry 4.0 is to control the machine, uh, have a real-time view on the environment, optimize your process, save cost, create better quality uh, delivery. So gentlemen, tell me, if we keep in mind the benefits of 4.0, where do we want to go? And the impact regarding the 4.0 on any businesses, but th this time we're talking about SE Tech, they've got an history, 1985, they're making stuff for cars, I don't Dominic, what's your take? What do you think you see as risk in there? Risk? Uh, no, this is the part where you're supposed to have a timer for me to stop me. <laughs> uh, the, the first rate risk I see is um, Industry 4.0 is all about connecting the various equipment that were not connected before. We want to move that from the IT to the OT, the industrial side, but also from the uh, plant floor back to the IT. So in, in the case of SE Tech, they, they probably uh, will <clears throat> go through implementing a manufacturing execution system in the near time. So the, the data will move from the ERP, their orders to the actual MES on what are the uh, work orders to be distributed on the plant floor. And then these work orders will have to be distributed to the machines. And in return, the machines will return the information back to MES and back to ERP. Why do we want to do that is if there's an order in change, there's a, a change in the material they have available on the floor, they need to be able to change their um, work schedule as fast as possible because you want to keep those machines running at, as much as possible. This is, this is the art of their enterprise. They need to make money with these machines running. So you need to um, be able to connect all that. And that's the easy part. That's the part <laughs> that people do mindlessly, usually just connecting those machines to the network. And here we go. In English, they would say, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But now the, the problem is we connected all kinds of old machines or even newer ones that are not made uh, with security in mind. So we just expanded from the IT point of view that handles the cybersecurity of the organization. We have expanded the attack surface in a tremendous way on a bunch of devices that are insecure by design. So yeah, we, <laughs> yeah, and it's that's how they were designed. That's how they are still designed. So how can we ensure that we connect them in, um, in a fashion that would ensure security as much as possible. Let's be honest, we cannot ensure that we have a zero risk, mm -hmm. but we want to reduce the risk as much as possible. So we're gonna be talking about defense in depth. For example, we want to deploy multiple um, uh, mechanism to detect, uh, identify and remediate if there's an incident. Mm -hmm. And as much as possible while allowing the manufacturing part of that uh, enterprise to continue. Otherwise, yeah. they're out of business. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing. Yeah, and, and all those integration, they'll have a ton of IIoT and those equipment, yeah, you have no control. No, oh, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's not built. It wasn't designed for <clears throat> security. And we're just starting to do that because we have, um, we're connecting the machine itself. Fine, that's the, We've been doing that for years. Mm -hmm. Now we're connecting all the information the machine is using to run as a machine. Mm -hmm. And we're bringing this information to the cloud directly now. So we're, we're bypassing all the previous intrinsic securities we had built in mm -hmm. because we're connecting those plant sensors, plant floor sensors mm -hmm. directly to the cloud. So how do we protect these um, devices from bringing back uh, infected payload from the yeah. cloud and bringing it, bypassing everything we would have put in place straight into the heart of the enter enterprise on the side that's less protected usually. So you're saying that uh, Acera Technopolis, our CTO, when he was thinking about moving some workload in the clouds, is actually going cloud without even knowing it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and, they, and uh, often, often what I've seen is uh, people they, they buy new sensors, new actuators. They're they're nice, and the vendor that sells that goes with oh, 
for a little fee, you can you look at it from your tablet while you walk in the plant. Well, the tablet is connected to the IT network, not the OT network, and it's connected to the cloud. So somehow these devices that you monitor from your tablet are connected. And this is, yeah. this is where, whether we like it or not, we are putting OT in the cloud now. There's That's different ways of doing it. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I know your take on that. Talk. It's a scary talk. <laughs> you're, you're from the old school like me. But yeah, it, it, yeah it punch is. card man. <laughs> I've done mainframe, so. Uh, <laughs> I was still selling it. <laughs> so, hey, tell me, what's your take on this thing? Um, so, the risk will come from multiple places, but let me tell you a couple of places where the risk is most obvious. Number one, if you take a look at a cyber attack chain, that cyber attack chain will involve a compromised credential in at least 80% of the time, right? So somewhere in, because a cyber attack is not just one event. A cyber attack is a collection of events that have been normally carefully orchestrated um, and, and patiently orchestrated, but somewhere in there, there's a compromised identity, okay? And that's risk number one. 80% of these attacks will have a compromised identity. So what will you do to prevent identities from being compromised? And it, in the unfortunate situation where they would be, how can you remediate very quickly, okay? And number two, that's a more recent phenomenon, and a little bit like Dominic was saying, is 62% of the threats of cyber attack now come from the supply chain. They're outside vendors, outside applications, going to the cloud, data that is being harvested and collected um, with or without users knowing about it, right? So, so the supply chain is now a, an important risk factor. So what do you do to mitigate that risk, right? How do you treat your outside vendors? How do you treat your outside applications? How do you treat the harvesting of data that you might or might not want to happen, right? So, so basically that's where we're going. At the linear, we're going towards how do you identify the identities? How do you monitor what these identities do? What kind of privileges these identities have? And how do you mitigate a compromised identity, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's basically what we see as the risk and what we see as the, um, the, the vectors of preventing the risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and those, those, when you think about, okay, we're thinking about uh, those uh, identity being, uh, stealing those identity or getting access with that. But if you think about the, the person that's doing the maintenance on the machinery, you have no, pers you, you have no control of who he, who he actually is, what he did was his laptop the night before, wh where he was, and is com coming onto your, where your livelihood, because your, your, your flat floor is your business. You lose it, you lose your business. So this guy is a major risk. Yep. So, so what, what you need to do is you need, uh, and I'll go back to what I said about privileges, right? You need to make sure that the, that individual has the least amount of privilege, po uh, privilege possible. Okay. That's number one. But number two, uh, and that's the hardest part, is there are dozens of point solutions in the industry that will mitigate just a tiny part. So you mentioned about, we don't know where he was with his laptop last night, right? Well, you can solve that issue with one component of the cybersecurity space, mm -hmm. but there's thousands of vendors, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then if you want to monitor what that user is doing on your network, that is something different because it's your network. It's his machine on your network. So you want to make sure that you monitor what he's doing and preventing him from doing things he shouldn't be doing. That's another point solution, right? So you need these point solutions to serve, work together, or at least at the minimum, identify that something is happening and that something is not necessarily along the lines of what you're expecting, right? So it's not easy. And we'll talk about it during my presentation, but, but it's, it's not easy because there's an assembly of point solutions that need really to talk to one another. And right now they don't. So you need to identify what's happening. You need to put mechanism in place to make sure that you prevent that. And 
again, worst case scenario is something happens. How do you remediate it quickly? Well, I can tell you one thing. You see, you know, there's always people that's going to be reticent to, you know, changes. So yeah. if you think about the floor plan, you think about the operation, guys, you're going to do what to my guy that's doing maintenance of the machinery? You're going to stop him from connecting? What are you going to control? Uh, steams. Yeah. We're coming back to the 1870 with steams now. Steams coming up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> True. And your take on this thing. Uh, uh, in particular, risk, right? So... And I'm going to look at the, the problem set maybe a little bit differently than, than my peers down the aisle. Um, but when, when we look at risk associated with things like modernization in client environment, and while you were describing this particular client scenario, fictitious client scenario, I was thinking about one of my customers um, that is a, a global engineering firm. Um, and I'm thinking about the scenarios that they're trying to mitigate and the risk that they're trying to mitigate in the context of what you were describing as they go through their modernization journey. And it, a lot of it is centered around how data has evolved in corporations over the last 40 years. So we started off with very well-governed sources where the data was known. It's in that system, it's in that one system, and we all have access to it and we're gonna use it and we're gonna benefit the business by consuming that data and using that data to grow the company. However, in the last 40 years, we now have a situation where people have extremely complex data holdings, um, data of all kinds, digitized documentation, so structured data and unstructured data. We have it distributed on the cloud. We have hybrid clouds. We have multiple on-premise uh, instances of data across systems, and we have third-party systems that are holding data. But in the context of where we are today in our in the evolution of IT and the evolution of data management governance, we now have laws and regulations that are revolving around the world that are dictating to companies that they can't operate and manage that data the way they used to. Starting off mm -hmm. with GDPR in Europe and then obviously evolving here in the North American marketplace with California and now uh, with Quebec with uh, Law 25 and C27 coming around the corner in the Canadian market. Those laws change how we now have to address that risk of all that data that's distributed. Those laws came out because of the surge in data breaches from around the world. Those data breaches are arguably because organizations haven't put in place the security infrastructure at a pace that's necessary to keep up with what's going on mm -hmm. in the world today. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, many organizations outside of regulated industries like financial services haven't put in place governance programs and policies to manage and govern that those data elements that are distributed across all those different kinds of environments. So breaches happen. Unfortunately, they happen a lot. Um, I read a stat a couple of weeks ago that something about 83% of US-based companies, I don't have a Canadian stat, but it's probably on par, prior to 2022 had a breach. That's out of this world. So governments are stepping in saying, okay, we're going to regulate, right? Now we have regulation. So how do you now govern those data assets in light of that? And what is that risk factor you have to worry about? So regulation means there's going to be fines and there's going to be obviously, you know, government pressure to change how you govern the data. So that's a risk factor. Another risk factor is something that's not really often talked about, and that is reputational damage to a company. <clears throat> So if there is an incident and your data is breached and you are now the latest headline, what's the impact of that on your customers and potentially the vendors that you do business with as well? Because at the end of the day, you're not only holding your data, you're holding data from other organizations and customers within your uh, particular data holdings within the organization, which multiplies your risk. So you've got that factor occurring um, where reputational risk is going to impact your business. Uh, and we see that all over the industry today. The other risk factor is litigation. So unfortunately, in the Canadian marketplace, it's on the rise um, where an organization may have a, a data incident or a breach. That incident drives awareness by the legal community. And obviously anybody who's been involved in that breach, whether it happens to be your corporate customers or your, um, your the consumers of your products and your technologies are 
potentially going to um, put together a mass tour. And that is going to have a significant financial impact on the organization. We see it in the US happening all the time. We now start to see it here in Canada happening very frequently. Um, one of the major law firms in Canada just recently distributed a paper where they were talking about this happening on a much more regular basis. Um, we all thought it was just the US phenomena, but sadly it's not. So when you think about financial exposure and risk mm -hmm. in an organization, those are the things that really are what we're seeing in the marketplace today. And a lot of it being driven by this massive growth in data, the distribution of data, the modernization of where we hold our data and how we manage the data. One more risk factor, and then I'll shop and stop rambling, <laughs> is, is in the contractual obligations that an organization has with their vendors and with their customers. And those contractual obligations are now dictating that companies must, it, must manage their data in line with the vendor and in line with whoever you're selling your product and technology to. As an example, that global engineering firm I was referring to sells to the government. Well, the government dictates to them how they have to manage and govern that data that uh -huh. they hold about that government entity within their organization mm -hmm. to a standard that they've never had to adhere to before. So how do they govern those data assets? What's the risk if there's an incident to that contract that they hold with the government? It's mm. massive. That can sink the company uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, and if you think about as you think, they're making steel parts for cars and for aerospace. You've got, I am sure that they would they have to respect some clause that, hey man, if you don't deliver, you need to have these yeah. type of infra in place, information in place or security in place to make sure that you're able to deliver when you're supposed to deliver. Absolutely. We're, we're involved in a, in a data breach incident right now. Uh, a law firm brought us in to help manage the data uh, elements that were involved in this particular breach incident. And there was three parties involved. So the party that had the breach was a organization that had lots of consumer data. Mm -hmm. So the consumers are impacted by that. Issue number one. However, one of their vendors is a massive insurance company. <laughs> that massive insurance company has a lot of data sitting in that organization's holdings. Well, that massive insurance company does business with the Canadian government. So the Canadian That's... government's data <laughs> was, it cascades all the way uh... down to that particular incident. So now there's gonna be a contractual discussion and how people are now governing and managing their data across that entire vendor ecosystem, the supply chain mm -hmm. in effect. And it, it's messy. And you think about all those risks, thinking about industry 4.0 and that, that business where you'll have a lot more exposure uh, yeah. in the system. You've got today, uh, you know, attacks with payloads for the industrial side. The payload is built for the OT, for the SCADA, for the PLC. It's built for that. It's understood. So it's not only, uh, like you you were mentioning, and that, if you're lucky, the attack is a one-click bomb. You got an email, you click, it's done. When it's really something that you were targeted with that in mind, they're there for months and months and months. So those data, they've got it. Those, they've got everything in your business to put you down. So now thinking about our day today, now we understand the business, we understand where they want to do, we understand the new risk. Let's look at uh, what you'll be covering in your session, in your workout this afternoon. How are you going to help uh, them into this? You want to start, Eric? Oh, me? Oh, yeah, I'm changing, sure. I'm changing <laughs> thing now. <laughs> sure. Well, well, we'll talk about um, basically two things. We'll talk about access. Who's got access and how do you control access? How do you monitor access? How do you record access? And we'll talk about privilege. How much privilege do you give? Um, there was a, a, a word in your introduction there for um, manufacturing 4.0, uh, the concept of just in time. Mm -hmm. How can you give access just in time for one specific privilege at one time, right? For a user to perform a certain task and then scale down privilege again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we'll talk about that, but that is, that is um, fundamental. Uh, what is happening now is with the proliferation of 
uh, cloud workloads, cloud applications, uh, large organizations uh, are running in most of the cloud providers, they've got applications in Azure, some in Google, some in Amazon. And what we're also trying, what we're also seeing now is, is that some identities are used to go from one cloud to the other, and even machine to machine identities. So you've got identities that are going from cloud to cloud, and you need to make sure that you can monitor these identities. You need to make sure that these identities have the proper privileges, and you need to make sure that you need to identify if an identity or someone pretending to be someone has an abnormal behavior, right? And how do you remediate that? So, so that's what we'll talk about. We'll talk about the discovery of identities, the management of the identities, the privileges associated with the identities, the monitoring of the identities and the remediation of what happens if an identity gets compromised. Looks complex. No, it's very easy. See, it's okay. just one chart. <laughs> <laughs> I got scared there. <laughs> I won't go, we're completely playing role now, so your turn. Uh, so we're going to uh, put things in the context of two potential scenarios. Um, one is compliance with Law 25 and the evolving regulation on C27 at a national level, and then how to adhere to those uh, new regulations to govern your data assets from a privacy perspective. The other perspective that we're going to talk about at the same time is how then to govern sensitive data assets in general within the organization, obviously in the context of the risks that we talked about a little bit earlier. So you've got privacy legislation, you've got potential breach scenarios, um, you have contractual obligations, and then governing those data assets in the context of all those things is going to be really the heart of the entire conversation. Okay. And I'm going to throw you a curve here. Ah, okay, go. <laughs> Actually, because... You may you you remind me something about the rest of the worldwide regulation. So you got a GDPR, you got all these guys, yeah. and when I'm thinking about SCA Tech, they're making car parts, they're making aerospace. So it's not limited to uh, Montreal. No. So they yeah. they they're their customer and they're all over the world. Yep. So I guess we can do something with that. Yeah, you've got, that's a significant challenge. So it, we, in our world, we call it data regionalization. Mm. So the data that comes from this country is exposed to that law. So if you're pulling data out of France, you are exposed to GDPR. Mm. You, have a, you have a responsibility to manage that data asset in light of GDPR. You're absolutely right. The other thing to think about is that if you're doing business with a vendor or a partner, you're selling your car parts to XYZ organization overseas, you're going to be collecting a lot of information about the, the specifications associated with that particular part and the process associated with that from that overseas entity. And you're going to have that data within Canada. That presents a whole other issue associated with how you then have to govern those data assets that you brought in from another part of the world. So major topic. Yeah, and you think about, again, Quebec 25, C27 is not in place yet, but still Canada that does business with us. Yeah. C25 is, the Bill 25 is there. Yeah, absolutely. And, <laughs> and all those other global regulations yeah. that you need to adhere to. And I guess you got solutions for me too. Oh, I do. <laughs> and yeah, the, so actually the challenge for me was what to talk about today because uh, Fortinet, we have uh, a lot of the point solution um, Eric was talking about. But I, I guess what I want to talk about today is uh, the concept of the Fortinet fabric where we want those point solutions to be able to talk together. So we, we want to move away from uh, the concept of individual solution into a platform. And the goal with that is to uh, minimize the impact. So as we're expanding the attack surface, especially in the OT network, uh, we want to uh, manage both the IT and OT side together as one. Now, the, the thing to remember uh, also, I'm gonna talk a lot about deception. Why deception? Because whenever we want to do something on the OT network, as you said, don't touch my don't touch my machine. Don't touch mm -hmm. my my production. Yeah. It's it's running. And they people, used to be completely isolated. These yes, guys. but it's not. But you talk to operation manager, for example, uh, and it's the same thing for uh, our use case here. You say I'm going to add something to that machine. I'm going to uh, 
change something how that machine operates and they're like no it's running don't touch it oh. so what can we do to address that so we were i want to talk about deception on a way to monitor and gives uh, give us uh, early indicator of compromise mm -hmm. so in a defense in depth uh, solution where we get different uh, components mm -hmm. uh, covered um, if something happens we need to be able to find out as soon mm -hmm. as possible what happens and the idea by uh, uh, looking at what's happening on the ot side of the organization as actually serves two purposes we've always been talking about protecting the ot side from the it but nowadays, with all the remote accesses and connections and contractors coming on the OT side through some means, we want to protect the IT nowadays mm -hmm. from the OT because mm -hmm. it's fine to protect the OT, make it make sure it runs, but it can be the door now to the mm -hmm. enterprise. As you said, there's um, payloads now that are targeting those um, components, industrial components specifically. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're like wipers. The goal is to cause damage <laughs> but sometimes it's just to get a foothold in the place to see even further and then get access to yeah. all the data that uh, exactly. mark was talking about and the architecture on uh, when you think about the ot side there's different framework you've got the Purdue, you've got the iec 62443 i guess your, your your solution or the way you architect your things is always based on those frameworks Yes, so uh, mostly 62443 because it actually has a reference model in it. Purdue, I like as um, uh, a way to show the old things, how it was done before. But sadly, as I said, if we have devices now that are connected to the cloud directly, this bypasses the whole Purdue mm -hmm. model um, in one click. <laughs> yeah, it's a, there's a way of doing so. Yeah, but the, actually, I, I look at Purdue as a your 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 architect your VLAN or communication architecture. Then you put your components real to secure and inline the vision of the six two four four three. So because we're connecting everything now, we have to find more of a logical yep. way to apply the Purdue where before it was a physical means. There was and, no way to. And then there's it. the cloud in this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a lot of pleasure. So this afternoon you'll see uh, all the partners going to be sharing the how they can help you, how they can help actually Asia Tech uh, in, their, their, their pro, in their implementation of this thing. Uh, I want you to take note that uh, we were supposed to have Dark Trace with us today and they, uh, for, uh, they, they got a, some, some issues so they couldn't be here today. So we've put the people that registered that wanted to uh, uh, look at the Dark Trace session with our other partners. You'll have a lot of good information there. Other thing to keep in that in mind is that uh, during the breakout session, all the you the microphone will be off. Please don't turn it on. And if you want to write a question, the question we're using Zoom and Zoom their 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 uh, board thing is not optimized yet. So if you want to write a question, just first thing you have to write is which partner you're with. Because it's a global, it's every session together in the in the, the the chat part. So if you were with Fastnet, Fastnet, here's my question. So this way will be uh, safer. We'll just, it's going to be sure that the right person answers the question. Because if you write something uh, for uh, Fastnet, but uh, Mark decided to answer, it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awkward. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's going to be fun. <laughs> Let, let do, let's do a swap. Oh, boy. Yeah. So, uh, like I guess FATSNET is going to be handling uh, the, the IT OT framework, the integration of the IT OT. That. We've got uh, uh, Data Sensor is going to help uh, Cornelia. Uh, Delnia will look at the, uh, the uh, uh, OT, IT, remote access, remote staff, yep. ID, identity. And uh, Zscaler will look into their, their shared responsibility and the access in the cloud. When you go to cloud, there's not because some people think that you're going cloud, you have no responsibility on security. Uh, it's there. <laughs> you, you, do have a, you do have your responsibility to secure environment, especially if you're going SaaS, you've got identity management to do there. Very important and manage your access. Your access. Uh, Nozomi will cover also vulnerability on the OT side because we've been talking about the, the architecture, the component, the sector. 
your machinery uh, as vulnerabilities like any Windows, because actually there are OS. It's different type of OS. Sometimes you just have Windows XP managing those system. Uh, so these machines are, are vulnerabilities. So Nozomi integrates with the fabric uh, and also allows you to discover and you know your vulnerability on the different system. And Arctic Wolf will be there to help you help as you tech, <laughs> keep you as you tech, uh, to uh, look at the if an internal sock is worth it or if they should go outside. How do you build this case and how do you uh, what's going to be covered? And again, ConnectWise will be talking about the cyber insurance. So uh, this is it for this panel. Let's see, guys, if you have something else you want to. Well, I know so. It's all good. So thank you very much, everybody, for being there. And the uh, breakout session will be starting soon. You will be redirected to your different breakout session where you've been assigned to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merci beaucoup.